Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for making the time and attending today's technical talk. Um, I know weather is not the best, but I appreciate it for coming here and being here. Uh, my name is Ali Reza, um, IEEE PS um, Vice Chair. I'm not here from AMO, so I'm, I'm here, um, I'm representing PES. Um, I guess whoever works in the power and energy industry knows about PES, Power and Energy Society. So if you're not a member, please join, and it's got many advantages. One of them is receiving a magazine, which is very technical, every month. Um, so PES, Power and Energy Society, has got more than 42,000 members. Um, more than 800 local chapters uh, and more than 1,300 um, PS uh, standards. I'm, I'm sure you've uh, seen some of those ones. Um, today we are here for an interesting presentation uh, from two great speakers, Andrew and Najan. Thank you on behalf of PS. I would like to thank you for I know you guys are so busy, and thank you so much for being here and preparing the presentation. Um, a brief introduction of our speakers. I'll start with Andrew, who is the main presenter. Um, to do the justice, I, I read uh, from what I've got. Um, Dr. Andrew King is a chartered professional engineer and holds bachelor and PhD degrees in mechanical engineering. His core expertise is in numerical modeling, particularly computation of Fluid Dynamics, CFD, in which he has over 20 years experience. Prior to co-establishing L and K Engineering, Dr. King was a senior lecturer at Kyoto University where he was focused on understanding mechanical systems, including wave, wind, solar thermal, uh, energy generating devices. Recently he has been involved in modeling markets, systems particularly about constraint access mechanism. Now it's time to introduce Marjan, I'm sure you know, uh, all of you know Marjan, not, not knowing you, Andrew, but because he's in the energy industry, so I guess I can imagine. Um, Dr. Marjan holds bachelor, master's, and PhD degrees in electrical power engineering. She has extensive um, experience with Australia's power networks, including the NEM, WEM, as well as other private and public networks. Marjan's work in academia and for power uh, work uh, in academia and for power utilities and consultants has given her an in-depth understanding of power engineering. Prior to co-establishing NL and K engineering, Marjan worked in a tier one consultancy as a technical director for battery and battery storage and distribution generation. At L and K engineering, Marjan has been heavily involved in grid connection particularly dynamic modeling of the Swiss, NUIS, and other networks. I must say, um, L&K Engineering is Marjan and Andrew's uh, company. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, now it's time uh, for our great talk. Over to you. Um, it's about inertia and best in the future, Swiss. OK, thank you all for coming down to watch us. Um, Basically what we're going to present today is a question that we had um, about you know, is the grid safe as um, renewables take over, particularly inverter-based resources. Um, mostly we're going to be looking at inertia, a little bit of BEST because that's one of the possible solutions for the inertia problem, potential problem, um, but also settling it in and if we switch it's almost entirely renewables. Is it possible to get rid of gas entirely? Essentially, it's probably um, the least political way of saying it. Uh, so motivation is basically retirement of fossil fuel generators usually means gas turbines, coal power plants, which are big spinning machines sort of coupled directly to the grid. These are being replaced by indirectly coupled generators, which is inverter-based devices, and one of the key things that uh, big spinning machines do is provide inertia to the grid. As inverter-based resources come online, we don't get really that support still being there. Um, so we're going to look at how much inertia potentially we would need in the Swiss as this happens, and also if BESS is the solution, 
how much would we probably need to do this. Um, our main aim, this is kind of a question we had for ourselves that we wrote up, did the, the work and then decided it's actually useful to disseminate more widely. Um, and we're more interested in the big picture, so broad numbers rather than detailed modelling. Um, there's lots of studies out there. I mean, this problem's been recognised from a while back. So that, um, there's lots of more detailed studies in there. So hopefully big picture numbers localised to the WA grid, the Swiss, um, to see how it pans out. So I'm going to start right back from basics, because I'm um, a mechanical engineer and did lots of energy balances. Basically, we can think of a power grid as an energy balance, a balance system. Energy in should equal energy out, and mostly that's how the grid is always balanced. Um, in reality, that's not possible to do for every instant. Um, and the way that that is covered for is basically throughout the grid, there's a big energy sink and an energy source, which sort of delays everything, slows it down so that on average, the grid maintains its balance. Um, this is basically uh, where inertia comes in there. It's a physical property, so literally you can get work out the inertia in there um, based on how big it is and how fast it's spinning. And it provides a resistance to acceleration and when it's actually spinning, stores uh, vast amounts of energy, I think in the order of 20,000 um, megawatt seconds, which is a lot of energy. And also, Spinning, we've got a fixed grid frequency, 50 hertz, um, about 3,000 RPM. Historically, there's not really any reason for that. 3,000 RPM is a comfortable number, generally, for mechanical systems. And in terms of balancing things, the system frequency is actually more of a proxy for the state of the system. Too much energy frequency rises, too little energy frequency drops off. So it's kind of the signalling mechanism, basic signalling mechanism uh, in there. Um, so if we put that in there, instead of having a straight energy balance, we get the term on the left hand side. Sorry, your background's lecturing, so I promise there's not too many equations in here. Which slows everything down, which is our energy store which looks at rate of change of speed, it's basically equal to the mismatch in energy. Um, this is the basic system and we can use this essentially to find out, along with the WEM rules, sets down some constraints in keeping the grid operating stably, put these together and we can sort of use them to find out how much inertia would be needed in the, the Swiss. So basically we start from the energy balance we're interested in the change of frequency because that kind of says how close we are to balance. And we're looking at contingencies, which is basically if a big generator trips out, um, like Collie is traditionally the largest one there, how can the system recover um, quickly uh, without causing too much disruption in there? So we, we have one equation which we want to solve, basically, which is changing grid frequency is the increase in generation, so this is the system response to the contingency. Uh, the loss itself, how much energy do we lose in one hit? Obviously, small things tripping off doesn't make too much of a problem. And also, lows themselves have a bit of an inherent response to frequency. So as the frequency uh, drops off, uh, they also give some relief there as the load also drops off a bit. So we can pretty much do the whole complete model uh, depending on the load, contingency size, inertia and assumed response functions. It's a very basic model, but generally when we're looking at these uh, broader questions, basic models are good because you can play around with them and really get an understanding of what's going on in there. And pretty much what we're going to talk about how much inertia there is in the Swiss, or maybe need in the Swiss, is based all on this equation in there. Uh, so the operational limits as well that we're going to use to see 
whether or not we've managed to keep everything stable. Um, basically, trying to maintain 50 hertz. The first limit is trying to avoid buffles, which is under frequency load shedding. Basically, as the frequency drops, we don't have enough generation. If it drops too fast and too far, um, this scheme kicks in, which basically says quickly, we're going to dump as much load as we can. So the first stage is at pretty much 48.75 hertz, so one and a half or one and a quarter hertz below normal frequency, and instantly the target is 15% of the load should be dropped in one hit, which is you know, pretty substantial amount, and it's also a pretty drastic intervention. So one of the main aims is to make sure that ovals uh, doesn't occur. The other constraint that we're going to look at is rock off, which is the rate of change of frequency. So this one has a limit set um, by AMO in the WEM rules, which is pretty much uh, the system should operate within the safe limit. So generally over 500 milliseconds, the system frequency should never change by more than half a hertz. Um, uh, the, there is a mechanism in the new set of market rules that basically says if you're one of the causes, so basically if you're making people, you know, making AMO basically keep the system in that band, we're going to try and do some cost recovery on you um, up until one hertz per second. So if you can sustain one hertz per second, then you don't have to pay anything towards maintaining that lower band. And then the upper limit, which is WEM rules appendix 12, is basically under generator assessment in the GPS. One of the tests for generators is that they can survive basically a rock off rate of at least three hertz per second. So this is the main one and that's pretty much the target. So the two things that we want to do when we're looking at this analysis basically make sure that we avoid uffles and also make sure that we don't have excessive rock off. So within that half a hertz per second band in there. So that's the background. What actually happens? So we're looking at contingency. So what happens during a contingency? So basically generator trips, we have an instant loss of load. Uh, then we have primary frequency response which are very fast responding machines. So these, their job is to pretty much stop us reaching uffles while um, avoid load shedding. And then as time goes through, we then get to secondary response, which is um, automatic generator control, which brings things back. And then as things start to even out, the, the last stage is to basically redispatch to make sure that we've got balance um, Currently, the redispatch engine works about half an hour intervals. It will move to five minute intervals, as in the east. But the part that we're actually looking in this case is um, that first response. The other one, which I haven't said yet, is the inertial response. So this is not actually a machine response. This is purely all of those big spinning machines in the system. As soon as we lose generation, there's an energy imbalance. Things start to slow down, so they rotate at a slower speed. But in order to rotate at a slower speed, they're actually losing energy. So that first response is an inherent behavior of these machines, and that's pretty much a key indicator of um, basically maintaining rock off at the reasonable limits. Where does inertia come from? So generally, uh, when a trip happens, the rotating machine keeps rotating. All of the current and voltage that's coming out of it in such a way that you know, it provides energy to the system through phasing. And basically, when the nominal frequency is lower than the rotational speed, energy is supplied. When it's higher, energy is taken out. And generally, conventional generators are the main source 
for inertia, particularly in the Swiss, so gas turbine and steam turbines. Um, as far as I know, there's no synchronous condensers in the Swiss. So synchronous condenser is kind of like a gas turbine or a steam turbine if you get rid of the fuel part. So it's almost like a flywheel. Um, sits there, spins up to the rotational speed, so it takes energy out of the grid to get to, to up to speed. And then if an event happens, then it supplies the energy back. But it doesn't actually necessarily need to use any fuel. Um, and also anything that's directly connected that rotates as well. So this could be direct online motors and they also provide probably a large proportion of the inertia, but it's not easy to quantify without doing measurements on the actual grid. If we get rid of these big sources of inertia, um, what are our options? So basically, we could go through and put synchronous con condensers throughout the Swiss to provide that inertia back. Um, possibly not particularly forward looking. The alternative to real inertia that is starting to come through are actually using the inverters themselves to provide some sort of inertia to the system. Um, so power inverters are basically just very fast microprocessors with power electronics in there. Um, they can play around with the current and voltage waveforms pretty much, you know, almost unlimited. And we can do that um, if we've got a voltage source inverter, we can actually go through and directly drive the frequency in there. So we can say we don't care what happens in the grid, we're going to keep chugging along at 50 hertz. We'll manipulate our current and voltage so that we keep doing that no matter what, um, which is a grid forming inverter. Usually, I mean, you could think of it having infinite inertia, it doesn't slow down or speed up. Um, and then we get the next one, which are sort of a little bit more recent, which is um, virtual synchronous generators. So these ones have their internal reference. They also have the grid frequency. From that, you can actually write a function that says this is the response of what a physical inertia would do in terms of its power outputs. And rather than actually having that physical thing there, you have the microprocessor control the waveform such that you get the same response, but directly from the electronics in there. Um, still, there's energy missing from the system, so we need the energy to be able to do all of that, which is typically why the best is when this happens, because uh, battery energy storage has this energy readily available um, and you know, with very fast responses in there. We can also have current source inverters. So these ones still follow the grid frequency. They're just like an ultra fast response. So when we talk about BES uh, later on, we're looking at 250 millisecond response. These ones are even faster than that. So they can't provide that inherent response because they're still uh, basically sinking themselves relative to the grid frequency, but they react very fast, so faster than what we've actually considered in here. So basically what we wanted to do in this problem is look at uh, two sort of sizes of generators. We've got fast or machines that respond within five seconds and then ultra fast machines. Like we should have done these in a other resource. So what, what does it look like? So basically we've got our two requirements in here. Um, on the right we've got what happens in there. So depending on the system load uh, and system inertia and the size of the response, we can actually plot through that function what happens as an event. Uh, looking at the rate of change of frequency, uh, sorry, actually the, the change in frequency as these generators pick up, so the um, primary response and the inertia in there, as well as putting the limits uh, that we've done in there. 
we're looking at two speeds of response. So basically, um, a lot of AMO's work looks at two second response and six second response for generators, which is um, or inverter based stuff, as well as generators and inverters about two seconds. Bigger generators are about six seconds. So we're calling that conventional generation. And then we're gonna add to that mix some faster responding units. So I can't remember when the South Australian battery first went in. So its main task was to provide grid response by doing very fast um, corrections as the system frequency changed. So we're looking basically at that, that case. We have conventional generation and very fast batteries and what mix goes in there. We can combine those two in various proportions. So we can look at, for that contingency response, we could have all conventional generation, which would have a response time of five seconds or so. We could have 100% very fast batteries, which would have a response time to 90% and also about 250 milliseconds is what we've used. But we can mix them together, particularly as we transition from conventional grid to something in the future. Batteries are going to come online in stages. Um, what happens will change during there. So what we wanted to do is basically find out with various combinations of inertia, I'm um, sorry, of these uh, two systems, as well as various system loads, how much inertia do we need to comply with the rock off as well as um, avoiding uffles. So there's a model I think from paper basically says we don't have to model them together. We can put it, you know, basically fit a curve that says this is the average based on various proportions, put them together and solve as if we had one combination of these in there. And the idea of doing that is we get an equation that's very easy to solve. It's got a just straight solution in there. We can go through and literally at every combination solve how much inertia we need and then we get a, a map of the inertia. So the first case, or first thing that we did is basically, so, so these are the responses, is look at the short term, which this is kind of how the Swiss is up until, either, depending on when you draw the line, last week or in a couple of weeks, this Quinana Bess comes on. Um, the largest contingency was usually considered to be trip of Collie at 340 megawatts. So that was the contingency size in planning. Uh, inertia was not really a key consideration. It was always assumed that there's sufficient inertia that nothing's going to happen too fast. We don't have to really worry about it. Um, so it's not really set. So there's no mention of inertia in, in the prior rules. Pretty much you just had to keep the primary frequency response at 70% of that 340 megawatts. And to that we introduced our fast and slow machines in there. Um, traditional slow was 90% output within five seconds and fast we had 90% output within 250 milliseconds. And load relief um, is an AMO publication that basically fitted a response during one of these events and pretty much estimated the load relief of 4%. So we just put 4% in there, it's not really a, a big thing in there. And then we solved literally brute force the equations to find what inertia was required. Um, we did it once to meet rock off, I mean to meet um, uffles, to make sure we avoided uffles, and then compared the the rock off, and if it didn't meet rock off, then we solved it again to find out how much inertia is to keep that from changing too fast. And then we got these funny maps. So basically, looking at load, the amount of fast response, the amount of basically fast batteries in there, um, each of these grey points was a solution attempt, and we just find out how much inertia is in there. The key thing from this one is that really, to avoid uffles, if we don't worry about how fast everything happens, particularly as we go 
upwards and rightwards, we don't actually need that much inertia at all. So the top right corner we can pretty much run entirely without inertia, everything responds fast enough that you know, it's not a consideration at all. So that's one of the things in there. When we actually say, well, you know, we have to maintain this half hertz per second, we solve it again. So the same, instead of solving this time uh, just for Uffles, we solve for Rockoff. We get these maps here, which says that, well, no, we still need quite a bit of inertia to make sure that nothing happens too fast and everything you know, keeps ticking along as normal. So you can see previously on the top right, we had almost zero, particularly on the right graph here, we got to 8,000 or so megawatt seconds. So megawatt seconds is just pretty much the energy stored in the spinning machines connected to the Swiss that can provide it back. Um, and you also notice on the right, sorry, on the left hand side of these charts, there's no solution. And that's pretty much, if I go back a couple of slides, um, we're only looking at the inertia and the primary frequency response. So in those cases on the left where there's no response, it basically says that we, we don't have enough contingency response to recover without that second stage of AGC coming along. And the second lot of generators come through. So this one here, the orange line, is once we have all of those AGC generators come in. So we can still avoid uffles, but not just because of that primary response. So that's kind of um, where we are at the moment. Uh, we can see even at the bottom line there, which is hopefully what we'd expect, the required inertia is kind of near the current operating range, which is 11,000 to 80,000 megawatts seconds. And then it goes you know, less and less as we in increase more and more fast responding uh, inverters in there. The next thing we wanted to do was look at the median term. So this one, we increase the contingency size. So it doesn't seem like a good idea to keep tying all of this analysis to Collie because Collie won't be there forever, probably won't be there much longer at all. Um, but there are some other contingencies that may happen that are kind of loss of generation, but not loss of a generator. So at the moment, there's a transmission line going up north towards Geraldton, has some big wind farms connected to it, but it's a single string system. So if that line trips out, potentially we could you know, lose over 400 megawatts in one hit. So we picked 500 megawatts as a nice round number to consider. Um, the other thing that's happening is that as uh, DER comes online, the, the measured system load keeps getting lower and lower. So rather than stopping it, I think those graphs stop at about 1,500, 2,000 um, megawatts. We go down to 500 megawatts observed load. Um, I think end of last year, it got down to about 600 and something megawatts of measured load. And also, we want to get a solution. Um, we don't want to rely on a second stage of response. So we put 100% support. So we've got 500 megawatts of contingency support there ready to go, whereas previously it was 70%. Um, load relief, we left the same. And we solved it again this time. Uh, for as we introduce these fast machines, again on the left hand side it's more noticeable because we don't get as much load relief. As we introduce um, basically fast batteries, yeah, we get a, a big drop in the amount of inertia that's required in the system to keep things um, stable. But the rock off is well above the limit for almost the whole region. So I don't think even the safe limit appears on this graph. So we've got rock off at minus one, which I think is the um, 
cost recovery limit, and then higher pretty much for the most of the graph. So what we're going to do again, put the rock off limit in here, and then it doesn't look quite so rosy because once we account for maintaining rock off at the safe limit, we're up to almost the same levels of inertia that we currently have and currently need. So if we keep the rock off limit, then probably the inertia problem is real and it's going to hang around. Um, it's also relatively insensitive to the load as well. So we can see that essentially the reason that we're going to need inertia in the future is not really to stop load shedding, it's actually to keep the system uh, running and not changing too fast. How much inertia is required? So this is actually, with those two graphs, we can pretty much take one from the other and work out how much inertia is the bit that does rock off and how much inertia is the bit for uffles. And this is the extra inertia that's needed for the rock off. And you can see for most of these graphs, the numbers are in the thousands or so. So a substantial proportion of the inertia in the system is there to meet this pretty tight requirement to keep rock off at 25, 0.25 hertz in half a second. And how much can we change it? So we just played around a bit. And if we drop, um, this rock off limit, so basically say, well, we're not going to try and keep it within half or quarter of a hertz. We're going to let it go up to 0.5 or 1. Um, we can lose sort of, again, 10,000 ish, 5 to 10,000 megawatt seconds of inertia. So, one thing that can be done quickly is to play around with that limit, maybe investigate it more and see if that can be changed. Um, the way that it's set in the current WEM rules is that AMO just publishes that limit, so I don't think there's much that needs to be done. They can just change it as required, um, but that's one way that it gets rid of it. Um, the other thing is like, well, if we can't change the rock-off limit, we have to address the inertia problem somehow, and for that as well we get basically these um, voltage source uh, inverters to act as virtual synchronous generators. So essentially, rather than using physical inertia, we get it's kind of a grid-forming battery, but not in grid-forming modes, uh, to step in and do the job um, of these spinning machines. And if we were to do that, how much would we need? So we did two case studies, which is kind of the current case again, so 340 megawatt contingency. Um, in this case, we put 100% support and assumed that we're at about 80% of that is battery and 20% is conventional generators. It's probably a reasonable assumption. Particularly if we work out 80% of the 340 megawatt contingency is 272 megawatts and uh, Quinana Bess coming online and Collie Bess coming online will be 300 megawatts or so and that's happening shortly. Um, for this one, we're not using these batteries to provide the inertia because I don't think that they are designed yet to be um, grid forming. These are uh, current source inverters, so they can't really do the inertia part, but they can do the very fast response. And then put that on our graph and we work out that at a low level of 1500 or so, or, sorry, across that line, it's about 6,000 to 7,500 megawatt seconds we need, uh, which is manageable. It's below AMO's expected available inertia in the near to short term. Um, but if we were to switch that out and use uh, grid, uh, virtual synchronous generators in there, um, how much would we need? Um, well, so at the moment, so we're not switching out the inertia at this point, this is how we are at the moment, but we're supporting inertia with conventional generators. So in the short term, we'd need to dispatch 500 megawatts to cover that contingency. Um, assuming that 
our units operating at 25%. We need 700 7,500 megawatt seconds. Uh, you get an inertia constant, which is how much your inertia you get per basically megawatt or MVA. Uh, four is a pretty good guide for a conventional generator. So to get our required inertia, we need about 475 megawatts to do that of conventional generation. The problem is that we're looking at um, low loads. So we've only got a thousand megawatt of loads. We need to have 475 megawatts of conventional generators running to support the system in that state. So really, the system's gonna be fine, but the problem is that we've had to supply 475 megawatts of conventional generation, which, depending on the time of day, is pushing out 475 of renewable energy. So that's kind of a limit to really going to zero carbon in the grid, is that we have to have 500 megawatts pretty much of energy to support the grid in its current state if we use conventional generation to do that. Um, so this is probably when they talk about, oh, we need gas otherwise as a transition fuel, um, because that's what we're talking about here. But in the medium term, we say, well, we'll get rid of that conventional generation and we use uh, virtual synchronous generators, which are basically um, batteries to provide the inertia. Well, one set of batteries provide inertia, another set not necessarily the same set to the fast response and see how much would we need. So similar graph, uh, we've gone to our larger contingency, 500 megawatts, 80% um, of it fast still, 100% support um, to provide that remaining 100 megawatts of conventional generation. We can assume we've got 150 megawatts of conventional generation at 30% output roughly. Um, gives us 50 megawatts of energy that they have to be providing so they can run at their minimum. Um, and we've got our fast BESS in there. We need about uh, 10,000 megawatts seconds or so of inertia to support the grid in that state. So rather than, and we don't get much inertia at all, which is kind of the same case as we had before. Uh, we don't get much inertia from that conventional generation still, but rather than providing the inertia from conventional generation, we provide it through batteries. Uh, we need, we get the 600 megawatt seconds or so from the conventional generators. We still need 10,000 megawatt seconds or so um, from other sources. Uh, basically the technical capability of um, virtual synchronous generators is they can still have an, you can still define an inertia constant for them, so megawatt seconds per MVA, and they can generally achieve 10 or so as a, as a currently achievable number, which means that we can divide essentially that 10,000 megawatt seconds by the constant. We need about one gigawatt of grid forming or virtual synchronous generators to supplant and replace the inertia from conventional machines. Um, this was the number that we were trying to find just because we you know, wanted to know how bad is the problem. But to be honest, one gigawatt um, maybe t five years ago looked like a, a large number. Um, currently, one gigawatt of BESS is not a big number, probably already within the Swiss. Um, there's planning for over one gigawatt of batteries. Um, and the other thing from this is once we do that, we've got our 50 megawatts of support still there from inertia, um, providing 50 megawatts of the load. In theory, we still we still need to apply uh, like the rest of the load, so we've got a load point of 1500 megawatts from some sort of generation. If we assume renewable can do all of that, we've got enough installed capacity and it's available at the same time, then we can do that full 1450 megawatts from renewables. Um, and if you put the numbers in, that's about 97% renewables, which is pretty 
good number to target for, um, and that's purely by making use of the current technology, uh, allowing for planning of the extra gigawatts. So we'd have one gigawatt of virtual synchronous generator, 400 megawatts of um, fast BES, and then we could run and up to a 500 megawatt contingency and everything's fine, and meeting the current rock-off requirement, which is probably quite tight. And I think that's... Here are some caveats. I mean, this is big picture numbers. So these are some of the things we've either really simplified or ignored just so we get numbers out. In the scheme of things, they'll probably change the numbers, but not by a huge amount. So we assume that load relief is constant. Uh, this is a mismatch between the actual system load versus what is seen at AMO's control room, which is the you know, 1,500 megawatts of distributed generation in the grid. So it's really a 2,000 megawatt load with a 1,500 megawatt of generation that doesn't appear anywhere. So the load relief assumption that it's constant is probably not, not a good one, um, but probably won't change things hugely. It's conservative anyway, what we've done. Uh, embedded inertia, we've assumed that all of the inertia required to make this point is provided by these virtual synchronous generators. In reality, there will still be direct online loads. Uh, there will be people who are generating steam for a process using their waste steam to still generate electricity and supply it. So they're still connected to the grid, even if they're not producing energy. So there will be probably a large amount of inertia that will always be there. We've ignored that. So again, it's a bit of a conservative assumption. Um, behind the metering community best, um, the rules are a bit all over the place. But in theory, they could be uh, worked to provide some of that support as well. Uh, other things we've uh, ignored, synthetic inertia, system strength, uh, whether we're looking at pre or post contingency uh, inertia, and local considerations like can we actually put that machine there or is things going to go uh, haywire. But they're minor because there's some very big changes that are going to probably change these numbers entirely. So we didn't really look at the long term Swiss, that's why I've got basically now and medium term because uh, probably even 10 years away everything's going to look different. So bulk storage, one part of the problem is keeping the grid stable. The other part is when we have a run of pretty much like we had today minus the wind. We don't have much sun, we don't have much wind. We still, if we're 100% renewables, we need to have that energy. So that's bulk storage. If it's pumped hydro, say Collie Mine, Shaft, reuse, we use the height difference there to provide the elevation, pump backwards and forwards, they're still spinning machines, so we get inertia from that. Compressed air energy storage as well, similar thing, spinning machines, we get inertia from that. So there's still, potentially as bulk storage comes on, other sources of inertia. Fleet electrification, this is on the other end, there's going to be a lot of extra battery in the grid, either as a load or, um, I think there's a VS. Um, vehicle to grid trial going on in South Australia at the moment, so that potentially batteries will go both way. So that's probably orders of magnitude um, change to what we've modelled. Other technologies, uh, contingency support is a lot of megawatts, but not much energy. Um, the events only last a handful of seconds, so the amount of energy even at 500 megawatts over 10 seconds is only small, so well within the capabilities. So it's possible that some other technology will come in to fill that gap without necessarily being a best. And then I think in the paper we put it as mega projects, and then a couple of weeks ago um, the government released the Swiss demand assessment, which projects a grid growth of the Swiss to in the order of 10 gigawatts, uh, supported by 50 gigawatts of renewables. Um, which their um, industrial loads on there, they're probably more inertia dominated ones potentially. And also looking at building 500 kilovolt double circuit lines everywhere, which plays around on the contingency side because if you've got a double circuit line, 
planning criteria is you know you don't allow for that contingency because the other side will take the load. Um, now, time to answer any questions that you've got. Thank you, Andrew. Do you have any? Thank you very much. Uh, sure. Uh, now it's time for a question. Um, feel free to ask any questions. Um, yes, Lucas. Oh, oh, sorry. How often would this system be able to discharge the batteries? How long will it take to recharge them? And are you still looking at the to recharge the batteries? Uh, we haven't considered that at all, but um, this is the grid support part, which is that it's not a very large amount of energy that's needed for the contingency service. So um, I think I've got it one and a half megawatt hours. So out of a you know a 200 or 100 megawatt two hour battery is just a small amount. So it won't take very long, but it's the same as what happens with the inertia. When you have an event with spinning machines, they're all slowed down, so you have to speed those up as well. The advantage of a battery is that they're not connected. So when it's a spinning machine, you have to spin that up. As the grid spins up, when it's a battery, you can discharge and charge to replace that lost energy whenever you like. So you could have two or three events in a day? I, I, an impact. I would say, yeah, based on that, that's probably I don't know, I haven't looked at that, but I assume that it's not. I asked that question today down there. Two hours. Two hours? Two hours discharge, two hours recharge. Oh, that's so for the... Yeah. Um, I think one thing that we didn't, we haven't considered because it's a bit more detailed, but obviously the amount of inertia provided by battery, depending on if it's charging or what is the capacity that's charging at, got to be different. So when we put one gigawatt, t uh, sorry, uh, the numbers that we are coming here, like one gigawatt, if you're saying, the point is we are assuming that that energy is available. But we know that for a battery, grid forming battery, there are different factors that how much inertia is provided by them. It depends on what megawatt is working at, like if it's charging or discharging, and also the uh, magnitude of the contingency. So if the contingency is only 50%, the battery if it is discharging 50% of the capacity, can still provide the full inertia. But if it's operating at 70%, then the inertia is less. So that number is what is, needs to be available inertia from the batteries, but when it's charging or discharging, then it, it will vary. And also, if it is discharging at its rated capacity, then we become like relying on overcurrent capability and those kind of little um, yeah, that is different for each battery. That, but it is big picture that that much needs to be available at the time. Yeah. Lucas? Yeah, I, I was just, it's, it's probably related to what you were just talking about, but that um, inertia to size ratio of 10 and, yes. and how that applies for batteries. I was just wondering if you could elaborate how, how you came across that number of, uh, I, and, and whether or not the, I guess the inverter is, is the limiting component or what, what limits how much inertia that kind of. So that is. number is based on uh, two actually uh, real projects that are in service. So it's uh, PCS 100 can, can support that and even bigger than that. Um, and Tesla batteries can easily achieve that as well. So, and as far as I'm aware, other technologies are very comfortable with that number. Uh, the limiting factors are a few. That's why it is around 10 or 12 probably maximum at the moment. It becomes like um, the energy side also matters because obviously we have very fast, but battery should increase its current, obviously. So we usually, if it is needed for that, we use very higher C rating uh, energy storage behind it. So some of that, um, if it is for energy, then you can see that sometimes they go with one C or half a C, even to save money. But for some cases, we have used like four C batteries or more to just make sure that we get that current really fast. The other ones is overloading capability, obviously, is limited. Um, the DC voltage side is limited. So there are a few limiting factors that sits in the battery. But that 10 seems to be comfortable, I can say. It's, yeah, some of them may be still not there, but at least we can, um, yeah, it's, it's tested.
Kyrgyz. Next one. Last one. Thanks for your presentation. I'm just wondering, you have used simplified Swiss model for getting these results. So uh, what are some of the parameters you have considered in the model? We didn't even go to that level. We, this is the, the Swiss model that we used was the one, that single equation, pretty much. Uh, uh, where is it? Uh, yeah. So this is applicable, there's a general model for studying contingencies on power systems. We've reduced the Swiss down to uh, load, size of contingency, inertia, and the response of all of those primary, secondary. So all the results are based on this equation Yep, all of this. Because I remember, I know that there is a Swiss model. Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe you have applied that model in some of the models. No, that's, so if we wanted to look at the local effects, like is that inertia available or what dispatch is currently there, both generation and available, we could look at a contingency in great depth, but we weren't interested in that. We just want to know for you know, planning purposes, big picture stuff, what would be needed rather than where it would be and what exact configuration the Swiss. We just, this amount of load, this amount of inertia, and this assumed response across all of the currently connected equipment. Okay. Yeah, another thing that um, in those kind of analysis that is bigger picture, it's a bit hard to do the simulation for it, is as we are increasing the amount of uh, renewable in the system, if we want to do any modeling, we will have a lot of other issues, really, because we have to do dynamic. And if you want to look at this analysis, it's only consider the frequency, which is like the governor sort of response, rather than um, a voltage stability and other issues that we have not. We consider that, obviously, when we go to 80% or higher renewable, we will have, in reality, issues with system strength, for example, in the system. But we look at that as a more local, type issue, we know that lots of great forming batteries will support locally. So it becomes very difficult because we can't look at one issue by itself. It sort of mixes up like all of these different issues in the network. And we think um, for system studies, probably only the current system or medium term with a reasonable amount of load and also lower percentage is something that is solvable probably, but um, again, um, we probably expect to see lots of issues coming out of system simulation that prevents to provide like big picture numbers. I think that's why we actually went this approach at this point. Yeah, um, the other thing is on these maps that we've done, each of these is a simulation. We did it for different contingency sizes. Um, doing dynamic simulations on the full Swiss model for each of those, they're not fast simulations. This solved each point in a few seconds, so it could easily fill up the whole map, whereas if we did real dynamic stuff, we'd probably still be going. If, if we include some uh, actual modeling of the renewables, especially DR, with uh, like the coal based power plant going on, I believe the results could have a little bit different impacts on the cost value specifically. Quite, quite possibly. Um, the rock off is purely that from that that we've modelled in here. Um, and again, I'm not sure where where the number even comes from from Amos. We <laughs> start sorry, the the 0.25 hertz per 500. Oh, that's the statement we based on the industry survey we've done. That's that, yeah, there okay. is a report. Uh, yeah, I think that's G. Uh, yeah. So yeah. that one um, yeah. we've yeah. actually looked through that report and it's I mean there's probably room to just tighten that without actually doing too much as well which reduces inertia by a, a huge amount. The other thing is there's a point probably where you switch the rock off from being the system providing it to the system meets three and if you need tighter rock off then everything is on your side of the meter mm. potentially. But that's not at that point yet, but there's probably a point where Amy says, right, we're not doing that anymore. I Maybe. Suppose, <laughs> I don't know, that's right, yeah. yeah that's right. I suppose one of the um, sort of output of that for us is like, if currently we look at the system, 
with the batteries that is planned, it, are they required to look at grid forming battery or not? That was a big question, sort of. Is inertia is something that we can advise people who are investing that, yes, spend that more money for inertia or what benefit it provides. And I think from that results, uh, for the current case, what we saw is if we don't have grid forming batteries soon, under light load um, conditions and high renewable, we will still have to curtail the renewable because um, we don't have enough inertia. So it is an issue that we think that even currently we like to have grid forming batteries. So it shows that, um, yes, we will have to deal with curtailment of renewable um, in, a, in a short term as well. So I think that was uh, one of the outcomes that, um, w you know, uh, when we provide those kind of, you know, consultation advice, it, it was very unknown that really do we need grid for me now or is that just something for the future? Question. It's a little bit related to the conventional power generation method. That Swiss demand uh, report that you mentioned, yes. uh, they, uh, it touched on like a generation of 3.9 gigawatt of reciprocating gas engine, possibly. Uh, looking at those numbers, like 10 gigawatt versus like 50 megawatt load of conventional, yeah. how do you foresee like engines, like reciprocating engines, given that they're more environmental friendly, more efficient, fast response? How do you foresee the future grid that might require something like a more more modern technology to support batteries as opposed to existing technology yeah. like gas gen gas turbines or so coal we don't even mention like coal because <laughs> they're, they're gonna go out yeah. of the future. So. I mean as I understand it the reciprocating engines are lower inertia. Yes. But there's still the big problem that we ignored entirely for this was just bulk storage when we do that and I suspect that um, you know there's nobody's really proposed a bulk storage project that I'm aware of in the Swiss but the need for the bulk storage will be probably sooner rather than later so in that period before we get large amounts of bulk storage there will still need to be some conventional generation of some sort um, if the grid forming vests is there for the inertia, then it's not as important for the reciprocating engines to be providing that inertia as well. But we didn't really look into that much. Yeah, but I think that is, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, it's more about that energy side of it, because even if they are not providing much inertia, they just feel that energy side more than anything. So, um, I they, they are, in my opinion, at least, I can see them good fit to bars like when we get the bulk storage. They still need it because for the batteries, we are still looking at maximum four, four hours. And based on my experience, four hours is still challenging. So we don't have, I don't think in Australia, still commissioned. Um, so getting bigger batteries, generally, it's, I know that the idea is you just make it bigger, but it's, it's actually quite hard. So, um, yeah, having those kind of generators, I think that would be really helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? Matt? All right, thanks for the presentation. Um, just wondering, uh, what's your take on the converter-based loads that are also coming into the network as well? Like you mentioned hydrogen plants, I presume, I presume they'll have their own technology. Yeah. That's the other loss of inertia, which is all of those embedded direct online loads, which it's already happened probably a large amount switching to BSDs, where again they've become to couple to rectify and then invert so they can change their operating speed. Um, that's the other loss, but we didn't, we kind of ignored that for, for this case. But yeah, that will be a problem because everybody wants to do that. Um, but I think you mentioned about hydrogen one electrolyzer time. I would say that uh, we did some work on like um, one of the projects on North, the first one that is looking at hydrogen. Um, 
So what we consider is like for electrolyzer, you can drop the load probably around to around 20% or 30% because you have to keep them warm. And um, they are very fast. So we generally use them as like a fast frequency response type, um, which again goes to the same sort of equation that we have here. So they can provide that and definitely, I think, uh, definitely can be used, but uh, you can't play around too much for electrolyzers up and down as much as you can do for batteries. So there are quite a lot of constraints there, uh, but uh, yeah, I think uh, another detailed one, uh, we used it on that project to reduce to around 30% safely. But again, it wasn't, it's not a very big project. Uh, it's around 10 megawatt, I think, yeah. I think a lot more to learn on those ones. Yeah. Yeah. So, so part of our thing, which is why we tied it to pretty much now and very near to now, is that when you get to the very last slide, is once you start playing with these things, it's assumptions on top of assumptions on top of assumptions, and you're just swimming in those and don't actually find anything out. Um, this is more for our answering our question, so we put it in a nice, tractable problem that we can come up, solve, and put that in the, at least for what we were looking at, the too hard basket for now. Leave that to others. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Andrew. Excellent. Uh, thanks for, for the presentation. Um, just one question: the, the, the graph that you produce here is based on the seven percent for the short term, for the seven percent of the contingency size, and uh, for with the new market in place, so we are allowed to accommodate more um, contingency spray services. So how do you think you can just give us more time to keep up the pace of you know, more battery coming? Um, yeah, so we think there's probably a need to, to support more um, pending some of the changes. So I know the current one is that Northern Corridor, which is behind a single contingency constraint. Um, and because of managing spinning reserve and that constraint, um, basically there's a lot of curtailment that happens. So I think even in the short term, if you're able to support that full loss, then you don't have to curtail that renewables. So I think from that point of view, it's useful. Uh, in terms of other contingencies, um, there's ones about you know DER and clouds coming across quickly and then you know, dropping a gigawatt over a short period. But I don't think that's quite a single loss contingency. But yeah, um, we haven't looked into that. We just picked a number that looked reasonable in the very short term. Yeah, thank you. So I think um, for, for the mid-term solution, we're trying to look at the um, something to, to give us more time to, to come with a more battery in the system. And one of them would be you know, more services yeah. even larger than the continuous size I mean yeah. let's say more than 100% and probably dynamic the safe limit dynamic during the day the yeah. ace and the mix in the system so yeah. Yeah. yeah so we weren't we know that even that 340 and 70% is not how it's currently done it's a bit more in depth of you know what's the current safe are we safe what do we need to do to move to a safe operating zone? Is that curtail or is that supply more spinning reserve? Um, but for the modelling, we just made it nice and simple so we can find out what's going on in the broader, you know, pull this, what happens over there. Yeah. Yes? It's practical in, the, um, in, in any term to get loads that are transitioning to these inverter-based technologies to have grid forming capabilities or, or not, not grid forming but um, the ability to reflect the inertia that load might have provided? We talked about this ourselves a bit. Um, when it comes to batteries, batteries are instantly so they can provide, you know, well not instant, but they can provide very high currents very fast. For some loads, like wind turbine to get more energy out, you'd have to have a buffer somewhere 
or wait for them to spin up. Um, something like solar, yeah, if you sort of allow a bit of headroom, you can probably come up quickly to maximum. Yeah, but in terms of the load, we, we I think one of the challenges we have to have some energy available very fast. So um, how it can be managed with the by load you mean like BS? Well, say you have a motor that used to be directed online providing yes. inertia. Do you reckon there's a way to have a, a closed loop system where you deliberately slow down behind the behind the um, inverter to get that energy and feed it back out? So effectively replicating load inertia. I think if it is not direct online and it is through VSD, then yeah. it becomes not very easy way of doing it. Plus, you would need um, it is very similar to the wind turbines as we thought. So that is very similar as we know this. Um, and we know that wind turbines now they can do it. Uh, they are not very commercial yet. And there are different ways of doing it. Some of them is through the inverter. Some of them they try to recover the actual rotating energy. It is still early days that they are still trying. But as what you're mentioning, probably is not too far from that. Um, apart from that, generally playing around with load contractually becomes very challenging. Um, and how you know the regulatory side of it becomes probably a bit hard. Um, but technology-wise, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, when that comes, probably it can be done. Yeah. Um, I saw some like fax devices now. They they can do because fax device you you need to have some active power anyway. So that's a good solution and it's very proven solution as well. So it seems like then other options become available. So. And the other thing that we have assumed is that inertia with one gigawatt number is uh, really, we treated it similar to synchronous machines. So it's pretty inherent type response. So the pure voltage source behind an impedance and all of those stuff. Um, so that's, that's an assumption. We know that grid following batteries, um, they, provide, they can provide inertia within like four or five milliseconds, which is probably somewhere in between, it still doesn't quite arrest the rock off, but cheaper and they have improved like massively in the last couple of years. Um, from like a couple of hundred milliseconds now they are talking about subcycle comfortably. So yeah, a lot of changes. Um, but this is just based on proven technology at the moment. Thank you much. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, Thank you, Thank uh, you for turning up on Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. on, on behalf of uh, Power Energy Society, I would like to thank you both thank for the great presentation. Much. To be honest, um, I must say I'm really impressed with the presentation. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> someone who's got a PhD in mechanical engineer, uh, really impressed. Thank you very much. <laughs>